B, did you pick up your book? Hey, Professor King. I uh, swung down yesterday at about noon and uh, didn't see it there. So I figured uh, I'll be back down to campus tomorrow and um, run over there. And if it's there, I'll, I'll grab it. Is it on the bottom of the stack like we were talking about? Well, there's there's two places because I, I put it. Um, I put it out the door, but, you know, it's funny how things disappear when I put things out the door. Oh, uh, <laughs> okay. But secondarily, I told you there's that admin place where all the mailboxes are, by the ad, where all the faculty are inside the second floor admin. Oh, and yeah, for, kind of, and for some yeah. reason, the urban planning chair's got a whole series of them kind of stacked up. And I'm sure you can just oh. grab them there too, tell them that oh. you're in the class. Okay, sure. But I'll uh, I'll be there again on Thursday and put another one out for you. But it seems like I put one out and they don't stay there very long for some reason. Mm. Okay, well, I'll be. I'll be down there for sure tomorrow. So, um, I'll yeah, just, that. just, just, uh, pop in the door there with the counseling offices, take a right. They got okay. all those new wood kind of angular. I don't know why they're angled. So you can't see the mailboxes, I guess. And then <laughs> uh, towards the end, right before you get to the next secretarial pool, there's the chair of the urban planning department. Uh, and he's, he's got them up on a shelf outside of his door. So just feel free to grab one of those. All right. Super. Thanks. Good. Okay. And Angela, I'm interested in your backstory. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So uh, where are you in your career and where are you heading? Well, I would like to, um, my best friend and I, she lives on the West Coast and um, she wants, we both would love to do some kind of spa resort type thing. So that's why I'm back in school. Uh-huh. So. Yeah, but um, let's see. I, I mean, I've been uh, doing mechanical design or working in the cabinetry industry for yeah several several years. So I know yeah. cabinets like like the back of my hand. But yeah, so, yeah. you know, I believe yeah. uh, the Taliesin architects developed a uh, Wisconsin spa based on writing and language. I forget what it's called, but it's it's sort of mid state, maybe upper middle state. And it's a big retreat, um, kind of high end. And it's I'm, well, I, I'm not sure if it's Sundara or not. It could be, yeah. That sounds familiar. But it's it's the I whole know, kind of it's 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 almost like you feel like it's more Japanese than American when you arrive there. Yeah, yeah, it's an amazing place. That's that's where my best friend and I got the idea. Oh, <laughs> great! We, yeah, because we love that place so much. So yeah. yeah that's, well, yes, if you want the real um, inspiration, just uh, hop on a plane, get over to Kyoto, because that's where all that comes from. And Kyoto is like uh, Wright's real mm -hmm. inner soul. I don't know how he connected from Richland Center, Wisconsin to mm -hmm. Kyoto, but that's the only part that we didn't bomb in World War II. So it's very authentic, and it's got that connection between man and nature and indoor outdoor space. Everything Wright believed in is there in yeah. Kyoto. So. Yeah, I'm, um, I've always loved the Japandi style. And, yeah. Um, um, and I was really looking forward to um, doing the Japan trip until that got canceled. So I've, it's, I've, I've been pretty bummed about that. Yeah. Um, you know, funny you brought that up. We got a call. My wife just retired from the School of the Art Institute. And one of her, her past students from years ago was a young Japanese woman. And she got one of her degrees there at Institute and then started working for firms in Chicago and has had a pretty steady career. And one of her goals is to uh, bring Americans to Japan for experiences and sort of absorb that culture and then bring it back to understand design better because she feels Americans are pretty clumsy with design. Yeah. So she, she asked my wife just last night on a little Zoom call, could we find a way to bring students over and work on the restoration of some historic buildings in Nara, which is another oh, conglomeration of stuff. So uh, Matt yeah, Gerald. That would be is, amazing. Yeah, and Matt, Matt Gerald is the one that had an ongoing Japanese program almost, if not every other summer, certainly sometimes even every summer. But yeah. now he's locked into this, um, you know, the adaptive reuse with the German Institute. So I think that takes precedent over Japan for him now. Oh, um, yeah. Well, but, if, you know, if um, I have, I'm, I'm going for my B arc, so I have another year. Yeah. Um, 
and I'll have to do another summer studio next summer. So yeah, um, you know, if it works out, then that would be awesome. Okay. Yeah, she's asked. She's asking us for somewhere in twenty twenty four. So, okay. um, and well, we don't even know the length. We're all kind of just kicking it around now. And there's also yeah. art institute students that might want to join in for the event too. But I'm sure there'd be an audience for it. Whatever we did there, the idea would be maybe a three week program, and you spend ten days on site of the actual building to see the whole process of Japanese design. But yeah. then you'd see Kyoto and you'd see Tokyo too. Yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. Be posted. All right. All right. I'll, I'll keep in touch. Good. All right. So let's uh, let's get started today. What I thought I'd do is um, before we get today's drawing, which we're slated for the Hollyhock House in California, uh, let's let's not do that until the sort of second two thirds of the class, and just sort of talk about some principles related to your home design now, since that's sort of like the soul of the whole course here, because you can learn about right anywhere online now, but you rarely have the opportunity to actually design a right home for credit. So uh, we'll keep you on track there by talking about Wright's process and how he'd think about the home in his career. And one of the things I want you to do in terms of thinking about your own scheme is you're designing it for a particular site, but many of you might be designing it for it being more of a prototype. So within that language, your scheme itself could adapt to different conditions. And so you're designing one house that might suit many different properties. And that's that's Wright's background too, because we know about his really high quality work building by building for very wealthy people in the suburban area of Chicago in the first decade of the, of the 20th century. But along that way, he was a really good uh, marketing agent for himself and what he was trying to do. So case in point, is whenever he got um, the capability with the biggest magazines at the time, and, and magazines were really their version of the internet. That's where you finally saw things outside of your hometown. You can get like Life Magazine or Home and Garden or uh, Ladies Home Journal, and you'd be able to put in stories and ads about what Wright was doing. So he was talking about his work, but also selling. So he would take a home that he designed and he'd modify it to become a generic home in a prairie town or a small home house with lots of room in it. So kind of what you're doing now, trying to work from here's the street curve view, here are the plans, and a little bit of text around that. Eventually, we're going to talk about your interiority here that Ray would talk about in the plans too. He's selling to more of middle America or people the tear down from the, the the really wealthy people he worked for in Oak Park and River Forest, whenever he gets a chance. And that's a pattern we see in his lifetime that after his personal issues, that was the only way he could actually reinvent himself was do the ASB buildings, the American system built, which I think, you know, if we have, you know, 40 of you in the UWM program taking this class right now, maybe some of you are going to do this thing this weekend with AIS because we're the host to the regional conference for it. And I think one of their offerings is to go down to ASB. So jump on that bus and go see those six properties down on Burnham and, and you'll get the keys to the, the, the city block there. And that way you'll see coming out of sort of the deluge of what his personal affairs kind of ruined his career there coming back to the States, he starts working with a systematic idea to approach middle America with ASB and then for the bulk of you who chose Usonia instead of Prairie, that's why Usonia is there, because it's an acronym for United States of North America, where he's trying to do a home for everybody. And some of you who are doing really modest homes are right on that path there. Some of you have got larger Usonians, that's fine too. For those of you who are doing something more uh, manageable in terms of a budget, you're right on the course of why Wright even started down that path. And so I just wanted to make, make the important thing here is that what you're doing now with your pieces, whether it's Prairie Usonian, are in that lexicon exactly how Wright thought about the house. It was a one-off for one client, but it was a system that would work for many clients. So I think we saw that when uh, I think you read about, and I mentioned earlier, his biggest prairie complex out in Buffalo is um, for uh, the, the Martin, Darwin Martin, who was the tax accountant for the Larkin Company in New Buffalo. You saw the Larkin building earlier. So the notion that he was tested 
by Larkin first because Larkin was a man of numbers and said, go out and build a home for my sister on the property first and her husband. And if you do that well, I'll give you the keys to all my wealth and you can build your master, your greatest prairie home in terms of construction section design. It's the most well-built prairie home. And that's why all of our Mondays funded the restoration of it in the 90s there. So the Barton House is one of those sort of prototypical prairie homes. And I think some of the students are kind of looking at this type of scale of a very modest scale prairie home that might be like the Usonians kind of L-shaped and plan, or in this case, T-shaped. And you throw on a hip roof instead of a flat roof or take the hip roof off and you've got the language of the Usonian already, even though this is from 1906. So even at this time, I think the Barton House is actually an exercise for right to design for middle America, because this is a modest home at that time for maybe not, not the pure middle class, maybe upper middle class, somewhere in between there, where it was an affordable home. And that's probably more typical of the 700 projects Wright did than the masters we talk about and the ones that show up on the UNESCO site. So again, you're, you're stride by stride. You guys are doing a great job kind of following this epic along the way so you sort of get closer to Wright's language. So what I'd like to do is kind of talk through something Wright wrote about kind of later in the Usonian period. And I'm going to do it by just sort of, if you can follow along with me here without a base drawing, because we're just going to wander for a while. For a while. But it's, um, it's sort of a proviso that Wright wrote. Uh, it's kind of step by step on um, the small house. And again, some of you, I keep harping on your scale there because I think moving forward, the American epic is that we're going to have the individual home forever. We just have to make sure it's much more efficient and smaller and learn to live with less. So I'd like a lot of you to tamp down in terms of the scale of your homes. But in talking about the small house, here, here are the principles that Wright wants to offer to it. So when we're done here, there's like, you know, maybe 30 points of light here we're going to go through. And I'll diagram it as well as write some key terminology. Then I want you to apply that to your scheme as you think about your house from the exterior perspectives to the floor plan to the language of uh, your perspectives on the outside. So just as a scale reference, I'm not going to detail this out. What he's working with here is kind of a Usonian plan, but he puts a pitched roof on it. So we're kind of doing a hybrid here. And instead of having uh, what seems to be prototypical in the class now, I got a sort of framed out pen, uh, he's got more of a bar scheme. So it basically is longitudinal on the site. Okay. And obviously there's gonna be rhythm in this case, I've got the grid, the background, that might be the rhythm, but I'm not trying to be specific to the one he uses in the article, but it'll show that when it comes to a point in the central aspect over here, he's got his core. And that core is similar to what a lot of you are working with. That's sort of like the technology, that's the kitchen, that's the restroom, that's uh, where the boiler room might be in the basement, the one little square basement down below. And from there, there, that's the anchor to project out toward the backyard a little bit and then shoot out toward the carport over here a little bit as well. And then maybe for the reference in the front, he breaks the grid over here and expands and then bumps out some point here. And so it's kind of a prototype. And if you look in Storer's uh, book about all the right plans, again, this is like, uh, you guys were, have been inundated with the motion graphic your entire life. Motion graphics are really sort of a uh, modern phenomenon because film wasn't invented in 1890. When film got invented, it really is a floor plan is one frame in a movie to the modern movement. They see this in terms of rights language and how Kandinsky and the modernists and Picasso and people looked at film. They saw each panel of a film, which is 24 frames per second as a piece of art. So if you looked at architecture, we're all filmmakers, we're directors. And so right now we've frozen the film and this is the plan that we get in our part of architecture, which is kind of frozen music. That's what Goethe called architecture. It's a frozen chord. So it sings a song and it's monolithic because it's static. But if you turn the film back on, the planes in space I keep kind of telling you to explore and have them move in the three axis are kind of having their own family of ideas across how they sit on the site. 
and then how they project up. So this will be our model here to kind of build some ideas from in terms of how it's on the site. It's not particularly site specific, it's just sort of generic to it, but his first point when he talks about this is to stress the horizontals. And that's because he's a Midwestern architect and the biggest dominant kind of natural force we see here, because there really aren't many hills at all, is the horizon line. So to do that, we need to, because you, you can't stress the horizontals in plan, you can elongate things, we don't see them until you actually see the horizon line. And then from there is our relationship with that box. So we'll put the right point closer to us and the left further away. And so now we've got sort of the shape of this long box and right says now accentuate this idea of the horizon line. And that's where I think I drew in two thirds of your plans last week that you've got to think up materiality. They're gonna accentuate the massing you're doing along the way. So in this case, to stress that, he says always have a powerful middle line that cuts through the home, as well as the base, which is the feet, the shoes that the house wears, and of course, all your lovely projecting cantilever roof lines here. So in this case, it could be, you're looking at Usonia or Prairie, but this particular home we put in the article is really predicated on a Usonian plan with a pitched roof because the climate there is such, he thought it'd be better to defer to the nature of the structure getting rid of the water and the snow load than just the flat roof itself. So that'll come up later in terms of the pitch of that. Okay, so his next point is on the overhangs, don't be monolithic. And I try to do that with a lot of your sketches last time and let the, the, the overhangs relate to north, south, east, and west. So that north, let's say if this was the north side, you'd eliminate overhangs because you need to let light in there and not protecting the sun at all. Whereas on the south side over here, if that's the opposite of it, you'd have larger overhangs because you're working more. So south and west is where you're really protecting the house in this climate. And typically most of right stuff, even in California, when he worked in South Carolina, he still is working with a country that's north of the equator. So those are still the dominant ones you want to protect the house or allow the low winter sun to strike the glass on the inside. The next is the roof line. And so we know that on the, on the evidence of a small home, you walk through a standard door and that's going to be six feet, eight inches because you'll buy things off the rack for your home to save money. You don't need to sensationalize this with a specific door. And so the actual clearance there really only needs to be seven feet as you actually cross that threshold to clear the size of the door. So he said, keep that roof line down low because there's no need to give away and give a full height of eight or nine foot space in the outside of the building because all you're really trying to do is enter the skin somehow. So keep that low and think about that original wall out there is in the seven to eight foot level and don't open it up too broad there like the powerful entry I keep trying to deny you guys who want to have the view of from the curb to see a door. And that's really atypical for right. So bring the edge of those, those great soffit lines as they drop down to the ground at a height where it really seems like it's intimate when the person arrives into the home. And so that's Wright's idea that comes up later in terms of you want to compress the user in a small house and let them feel like they're safe and secure then when you walk into an eight foot space or nine foot space, it seems more grandiose. So at the entry, you're then creating this idea of scale to the user. So somewhere in here, you might slide through, it comes in, you're not gonna see the door here, you're gonna turn and in this little foyer then, there might be interest behind a wall and a wall that comes out this way. And so it's more secretive in terms of, it's not the glory of the classical where you come up, you can see a pediment and columns on either side. It's just the nuance of how you enter a home and prepare the people for the interior volume. And that's why you get into your sketch for next week because we need to tie that into your floor plan. Then he said that you can, the way you vent your hearth 
is going to be as minimal as possible in a sense, because that costs money to over exaggerate that. Typically the hearth itself is broader than the chimney up above, but you don't, he said, try to make sure that this, what you put up top in a sense is claiming an idea about the house. So that a bit of hearth in terms of scale that might run on both sides of the pitch here, isn't totally necessary to vent the flames that are down below, but it needs to have that principle of being centering where you're taking the Z axis here and you're going vertical with it through the home. And so don't make that too diminutive. As a matter of fact, the, the article he writes, he writes down, don't stick a toy chimney on the big expanse of roof, otherwise look like an afterthought. And that's something where contractors or tradesmen will say, well, you don't need that, let's just scale it down. And that's an expense worthwhile for Wright because it talks about the language of the art on the site where you're trying to drive that vertical and have it have a presence. And so most of Wright's Prairie Homes and Usonians really have an upscale mass that chases up that vertical line through the plains of horizontal. Okay, then we have to turn ourselves to, that's the chimney there, sorry. We're gonna flip this around because we need to go inside this box. So we're gonna still take that same horizon line. And this is where I quick sketch last week that how do we invert that box? This is the key corner we start on the exterior. We still need a key corner to start the interior, but now instead of being closest to us, it's on the other side of the room. So let's put that same space that might be six feet off the ground, maybe it's 10 feet high. So the, the increment above us, the horizon line is a little bit smaller than below us. And let's take, we'll reverse it here, let's say, we'll put the left point close and the right point further away. But now instead of doing the box on the outside, we're gonna run a light line to here and then draw the box and a light line to here and then draw the box. And then coming from the other side to here, and from there to there. And then again, it depends on your space and I'll just do something kind of graphic here to get us talking about these ideas. We'll end the box because you have to have one of the points within this wall you're looking at to keep you inside the space. If we put the interior ended outside the left vanishing point, we'd still be outside of a box. So the left vanishing point or the right, you can shift the whole thing over. One of the two points has to be inside the interior. And then from there, we do the floor line and the ceiling line. So still two points made this box and two points made the inside of this box. And now we know that that's six feet high and that runs across. And if that's six feet high and the whole thing is 10, then we know what I've sketched here, if we do a square in perspective, that that's about 10 feet, a pure square, and that's less than that. So the whole space might be 18 feet wide. And if we're just sketching now, that's fine for now because we're within a margin of error. Okay, so the key is, and the next point is to dramatize the interior somehow. Use some features which, which change the simplicity of the box and make it more eventful by simply keeping the scale of the low entry at a reference point that's actually closer to our actual head height. So if we're head height is here in the space, we don't wanna simply walk into a space that's got an outside space and a door big and just walk into a clean white box. He says, retain the aspect of having a lower roof line, a ceiling line within the space that wraps around, maybe a lower base at three feet for built-ins that wraps around. So you start to articulate zones within this space. And so in this particular case, we can then run that plane out. So it's further into the room on both edges and then connect over here. So if I simply did a value, the underside then floats to create a shorter wall here with a bigger roof. Now it's gonna pop up to full height up here. And then if we run the pitch of the ceiling line here, it might have brackets of detail that will start to shape that roof line above us. So it's still just an eight or nine or 10 foot space, but you're gonna work with your system of ideas of how you move from the floor to the ceiling and create a profile there 
so that you create more dynamism in the interior. So that's his language of trying to dom uh, dramatize that. So it could be through a drop ceiling. It could be through widening the view. And he was a fan of this because even though at the immediate cost is a little bit more to build things in, when the builders are on the site, the contractors, they like the idea of doing more than just a shell and then the other people come in and kind of design the interior. They, they do better work when you give them more tasks in terms of developing their language on the site in terms of putting the pieces together. So if instead of having furniture brought in, maybe this back wall has the furniture built into it. So in many cases, Wright has different types of design benching in the room. So you can then pull a table and two more chairs and you can have a dining area based off of that wall or behind that could have them, the built-in library that floats off that wall as well. And that way you condition and treat the space and show ideas that, that you're coming from, from your plan and you're gonna turn that into a three-dimensional essay because the real art that proves this is that one view that I want you to show by next week that kind of celebrates the the uh, the soul of the space? Where would you set somebody down and say, "Look this way," because it's about being in here, but then it's also about the view out to our exterior plane out there. And so, just for reference, we could put a series of interior walls in here with a series of casements, which will be writers that looks out toward the horizon. And so you start to develop that language on all these planes. And so that'll be part of, it's a drop ceiling, it's flooring pattern, whatever we work with coming off the left point here, you can say that it's a hardwood floor, but here's where the large design area rug then floats inside the space. And then dropping down here might be pendant lamps or you might put cove light in here that lights the ceiling. If this is a darker wall down here and you put hidden light that lights the ceiling, it tends to make the ceiling lift up. And so it even seems taller than its nine foot crown here. And that might pitch in this hall maybe to 12 feet. So lots of ideas where you can work on the idea of, of pulling together your language on an interior volume. He also said that some tricks in the view here is if you have these eaves, you're trying to cloister the home, it can appear periodically dark unless the sun's coming through your windows. So he said you can come back into these chambers. And if you know where your southern or western exposure is, you can actually cut in again to this proportion of us here. Skylights with the depth I'll draw it as well, that would be framed in and detailed in that ceiling to then periodically let natural light into the space as the sun moves across from east to west in the course of the day, it would change the character of the interior by having great indoor outdoor lighting in your ceiling skin as well. And that gives you yet another idea to come in and create a design language of how you want to detail and trim out that interior volume. So, and that's, that's really what architects kind of let go the most They'll deal with sort of the idea of what's going to be on the wall here, on that wall, the windows, and this wall. A lot of architects don't really care much, so they'll simply put a material down here, and they'll simply just figure that it'll be a whiteout space. Whereas Wright's working with all six planes. So it's very, very sort of um, a total artistic endeavor when every plane is as important as the next. And isn't just do as little as possible, let the homeowners come in and sort of decorate it. Wright didn't believe that idea of needing to decorate one of his homes. And you came, everything was finished. You could buy some of his chairs he would sell to various companies to kind of finish the space. But more often than not, it was kind of walk-in ready. And so that's part of what we use too. So uh, the next point then would be uh, if we added built-ins here. But to change away from the interior, is to, and this is where your plan comes in. Right now, I kind of sealed it off with a box and said, that's the end of the room. What I think in your plans, what you're doing really nice now is that you're going to break the box so that when this room comes over and bumps out, if I drew this corner now, 
you'd have a view from this room to that corner, which wouldn't end in the end of the square. It would take you with a little small view shed into another room over here. So that maybe there's a walkway through here an idea so that when your built-ins open up, you see this fluidity of space that kind of changes as you walk into space, you diagonally across, and your floor plan allows these box to, to entangle with each other in terms of movement of volume. And so that's where your, your corners will open up. So six is a, is a big point because it's talking about all these interior methods that relate to your sketch for next year. Okay, if we get back towards some exterior ideas about the home, um, Wright always thought that you're gonna have some carport here and maybe it's some people are drawing a one carport. I would assume that today's lifestyle have gotta have you know, the larger family car maybe and the smaller plug-in car. So maybe you could squeeze it in, but basically that's a big footprint. That's gonna be 20 by 22 kind of minimum for your reference for that. But he said, the idea is allow for a big enough driveway so that you can get people off the street because Wright would never want to sort of suffice to is that people would have to park in front here to walk to your home. So whenever they saw your home, other people pass by it, they're looking at cars first and then your home. So we like the idea of having little cuts in of secondary ways. So in case you entertain, more people come over and they can actually park on the property to get them off the street. And that might be, you know, the shape of the environment you're in, but that's one of his points he does. Uh, when it comes to the outside, now we're talking about that, and that the carport is sort of point number seven. Number eight is landscape. And uh, that's something we'll get to more and more as the semester progresses because your plan will be resolute. And I want to talk about more people talking about right now they put their plan in a big white box and they stick their floor plan in the middle and say they're done, where in fact, Wright says, that's a room, that's a room. That's a room and that's a room. So that you're creating at least four, maybe in some cases, some lots are bigger than get six zones and even sort of secondary zones when you come closer to the home. There actually are rooms you're creating that have the home as two entry elevations for the space. So always put yourself outside here in your perspectives and say, have I finished this room? How would I want to edge that with a neighbor with vegetation? So use your landscape as a design tool. But he said, stay away from maintenance because that's a cost of your time and equipment or um, people you have to hire, things like that. So there's a way to be sharp about this and use nature herself because nature is really good about no maintenance, which is the two words both ways. We don't want to do maintenance, but we want to know how to do it in the best way so we don't have to actually not do maintenance. And there's a book by Roy Diblick that actually wrote about no maintenance to show people how to do a natural garden in the Midwest. Okay, number nine is you want privacy on your lot from the street. So typically, and let's just say for this, this sake that did it'll drive you already. Let's say down here on the lot is the public walkway and eventually the parkway, and then cars and traffic and people walking by. And that's right there. There, it's nice to have view to your property, but they should be kind of sequestered off. So if there's a way to design your front yard and zones so that you create the sense of privacy, because you're going to have it in the back. Your neighbors will fence up or hedge up, and you know, they'll design as a cluster of four people, four families to figure out how you can have your privacy there. But in the front, it's really sort of up to you to, to determine that. And sometimes the government that you're working in will have that language too for you in terms of what the limits are for that. So uh, when you come back to your last bit of here, when you consider the landscape, privacy issues and stuff, he refers to terraces in the article so that and this was nice that some people did this instead of having in particularly the usonian home where it seems like it's one flat plane throughout the whole thing there's no reason why your house couldn't subtly 
and this is good for sort of moisture control anyway, um, work off the system that if this is grayed, maybe the first floor plan itself is tiered up so it actually is stepped down or ramped up from the front or something so that the actual condition space is not at grade. Because if it's at grade, you have trouble with a lot of moisture and conditions of snows and things pounding up the side of the home that really doesn't create a big enough foot for your home. So consider the idea of terracing down one, two, three steps. And then some people even went further and said, they're going to take the earth away and you're going to have sunken areas too on the property. And then some people actually have terrain. And so that might be a ledge there on, so they could have two spaces and a walkout basement. I think there's three students that are working with walkout basements. So that's interesting that you can think of that idea of using terraces in your elevation, in your perspective, so that it's not just all like the whole first floor is the same as the, uh, the side outside. You want to have a break between that of at least a single step, six inches. But it's always even better than that. It's better to get it up because people who live on that land, it's just a bigger problem sort of uh, conditionally for the quality of life around that lower 18 inches of the residence. Okay, getting to the end of this now, some other ideas uh, once you're in the, in the work area over here. And this probably is different now because this article was probably written in the 40s. In this case, the mechanical systems for some of the systems back then are much cleaner and purer and they vent properly. But he said, just for the sake of internalized rooms, there's ways to actually have the ceiling heights be taller in the kitchen areas or bathroom areas so that the odiferous stuff rises and is taken away from any type of thermal culture where it's drafted back into the rooms proper. So he argued for, as your tree builds up here, don't just flatten off the roofs there, let the actual spaces then have their clear story views up there so you can ventilate the rooms that are a little bit more different, the bathrooms and the kitchen area in the home. So that's number 11 in terms of odors. Uh, the kitchen, he believed in the hearth, and this is more so today than it probably was in a rights culture, is really central. And again, I'm gonna hold you guys because I know you cook. Generationally, you cook more than most ever generation that ever had at your age. So I know you prepare food. I know how you like to cook. You have to make sure your kitchens aren't just these stock boiler plates where you kind of wrap some cabinetry and put in that 20 foot triangle. You have to make sure it works well and it makes sense with you being there while you're entertaining or your guest, your guest clients are doing the same thing because that's how people are going to order their sort of lifestyle from the preparation and sensation of entertaining people through food is part of the language of the home now. So a real key point for Wright was to make sure the kitchen was sort of ergonomically really well designed there. And then he also thought along that same pattern as we kind of get to the center here, number 13 is the hearth where he called that the pivot. And so when you do your little chicane, when you do your sort of, you take, um, uh, a projection of a rectangle and you shift it or you move it or break a corner and you've got that energy. And a lot of times I would draw your geometry and your plans last week and try to find where that energy is in your home that's kicking out your volumes. When you do that, the hearth is right around there. Don't take your hearth necessarily and drive it out the outside edge and make it look like a painting on the wall that people can look at the wall because you've lost the centrality and the motion of it being part of the soul of the house. So centralize that and make the hearth just in that same kind of collection of ideas that are right there that are driving the whole project to expand and contract all of that sort of animation movie pitch of one frame now frozen in time from a kinetic idea. And then um, his last couple of points are about the idea of decoration. And so number 14 I look at is um, when you're done, and this, this is kind of a language terminology thing, is that I think a lot of homeowners think they would like to consider themselves, I'll create my own home decor. I'll go to Wayfair, I'll go to something online, I'll hire somebody who'll come in, and once I buy the home, 
I'm allowed to decorate it in terms of what I think I'd like to put in the home. Can you develop within how the home is built that you're creating the, the decor, you're creating the language of the arts and crafts of the machine and how it's really built is in fact the language of the decoration itself. And that's the real beauty to write in terms of separating from the rest of culture is that you've got a highly decorative language historically that precedes right in the classical language. And then when Wright gets done with his text at the Wasp portfolio, which lays all the seeds and gives the modernists sort of a, a part of their creed is written now and built in Oak Park and River Forest. The modern movement is now completely antithetical to this. It's gonna clean this up and create a lot of beautiful, lovely, cubic spaces on grids and simplified and kind of really elegantly minimalistic. Turns out when it comes to single family residences and even in the language of modernism today, and I think we're, we're kind of in the idea of being in, eclipsed in, it's still the modern movement I believe we're in, the way that historians write about it. They refer to it maybe as the late modern of the period. So in most periods of architecture, uh, if you look historically, there's early, and then there's late. In the middle, sometimes they call it the high, where it kind of peaks. Uh, that might be with Mies van der Rohe, Le Corbusier, and Frank Wright Wright. That was the best of the modern movement. We haven't really changed into something completely different from modernism. It still is modern architecture. So historians like to think we're in the late period with something coming down the road, who knows what it is, but that might be the shift. And maybe that's the culture of climate change is gonna ratify architecture forever and change what it looks like. But more often than not, what we built today is still modern architecture. So historically, when you look at a homeowner who wants to buy a home, they want something that's decorative, but they want to live in a modern lifestyle. They want ease and convenience and movement. They don't want the, the commitment to formalism and that kind of uh, severity of it. So they would like to work, live modernly in something that's decorative. And the answer to that is what you're designing now. One person that kind of understood that duality of contemporary lifestyle and something that's got a language of information design about it color, texture, material. So you don't have to bring it to the house yourself. It's already there, as Frank Lloyd Wright with the Prairie and Usonian. And so that's where we get this, this great movement between a big change in American culture that brought on where we find ourselves today. So you guys are designing these linkages to that. And so to this day, the people in Usonian, and even the people working in Prairie, we, there are still many, many architects that do Prairie language uh, homes and residences for their clients, as well as the Usonian architects that are doing the mid-century modern and revisions of that and trying to create that salvo for something that seems progressive, and yet it's really based on right back in the 1930s. So that'll take through, like I said, you could extrapolate out and say these are all individual points, but really there's like 14, 15 points we made here about how I want you to think about your home, because by next week, you're going to submit by 11 o'clock to my email so I can start working with before class next week. That key view, just a nice 11 by 17 sheet. Find yourself that one point that'll be close to us and one further away, and then find that corner that you're going to work from for us inside your space. And once you pull that up, you're telling me where we establish that horizon line, you're going to tell me that is six feet high in your wall. And from there, I'll be able to judge what you're trying to accomplish here. In this case, it seems like this is tall enough that would be the second floor for people at a balcony is overlooking something. Maybe it's one story here, one story there, a certain the center part. There's a two-story space that runs 
north and south in the plan. Whatever you do, that's your core here. And are you going to take and layer it in those 14 points of light that takes us from the language of your plan type into that interior volume? So that if you go back to right in a prairie home here, when he would sell, he would take people in a perspective of actually being in the home, in the hearth. And that's what we're looking for and how you're going to scale that back so that the exterior perspectives you guys are all doing now, which are all terrific, you've got to invert that now and be just as terrific on that one singular view on the inside. And then I'll be able to know from your past work you submitted exactly where you're standing in that floor plan. And I'll be able to help you kind of articulate that by drawing into that after your submission next week. Okay, let's move on to the hollyhock here. So your sheet you've got just says HOL in the lower right corner there. Go. And the rise line is really easy here. The, uh, the, the right point is on the page. So we come to the corner of the box for it and drop the two horizon lines, uh, lines of the box going back and it finds the point, which then gives you the horizon line coming across. So we're simply just walking up from the Western face of the hollyhock here. And so here comes my argument. But you heard probably twice already because it's really a bee in my bonnet that um, this is from, you know, 1919 to think 21. Wright wasn't really on site very much because he was in Japan doing the Imperial Hotel. So um, it's a great building. It's really fabulous to visit, but it's just not. It's part of a legacy, but it's not part of the legacy that Wright's really well known for. It happens to be a small palace which refers more to what um, we can refer to. And if you start to read more and more about Wright, and I think a couple of biographies might've mentioned this, is that there's a point in his life where they refer to his periods as sort of time zones. And so from when he came back from Europe in 1911, and started Taliesin, to about, oh, 1929 and the Great Depression hits, he still practices, and obviously the hollyhock comes from this, and it's a UNESCO site, but they refer to this, uh, the one writer who actually did his, his life's work on it, Anthony Allison, refer to this as the lost years. And it sounds a little bit like, you know, a dystopic movie or something, but if you look at this section of time compared to the uh, this sort of eight, what is it, uh, 18 year period or something. Um, it is a, out of sequence because the Usonian seems like it's just a modernized version of the Prairie Home and they're linked together, yet they're separated by this block of time. And this is the pinnacle of that because you, we still see Wright kind of in that past European mode when he came back and Mamie had wanted him champion of being sort of an international promise to other architects that he comes back and does things almost out of character. In this case, for Elaine Barnsdall, who, who you know, funds the hollyhock home because the hollyhock was her favorite plant there. So Wright picked up on that like he did the butterfly at the Dana House in Springfield, Illinois. So in East Hollywood uh, in California, he designs this really sort of a temple. And so it's got some things that relate to the prairie language. It's got a couple of details that talk about what's coming after this. It's um, it's a major building in California in terms of tourism and what LA is known for. And yet it still just seems like it's outside of what he really should be respected for in terms of architecture, his two major periods and what he's done in commercial work too. So we'll draw this because it's part of UNESCO and I didn't have a vote. So we'll go through this here, but it's it's just not going to be as salient as the other seven you're doing. So if I could switch these out, again, I told you before, I'd put in Johnson Wax instead of this. But Johnson Wax, I believe when they actually made the first list, they just said, you had to ask the people if they wanted to be on the list, and they actually said no. So, and what we're going to do is just simply start with really sort of cubic volumes here to kind of locate things. So the top of the box here on that front living room space, 
just blends these two corners together. And that points to our left point way off the page, probably another 11 by 17 sheet. So we have to be cognizant of that. So whenever we're drawing any horizontal, it's parallel to that, it's got to come down to the left point. So the top of all the embedded hollyhock plants themselves out of concrete are going to merge to a point over to that left on this horizon line. And then the sort of courtyard in the front, which is sort of framed out by the building, is going to have a horizontal that's going to run off that way. And as we come down to how the hollyhocks planted out front, the real hollyhocks, end up in a square base, which mimics the sort of temple-like aspect there. So that all these lines are drawing to the right, and now coming off the left, as the hollyhocks turn the corner, they're coming back to our right point, promontory, this one coming back over here. And then there's some pieces over here that are in the back of part of the courtyard. And the courtyard's got a great view too, but it's not as iconic as this temple thing that looks over on a sort of a bluff that overlooks LA as sort of a really iconic mass out front here. When we get down with the volume, you see that it's, it just, if you look at all eight when you're done at the end of the semester, it'll seem like this is the sort of oddball. So this, uh, what happens here is we're looking at a very formal Beaux-Arts plan. And why is it Beaux Arts? Because Wright spent those two years with MAMA looking at what is the Beaux Arts? It's the beautiful arts, it's architecture, painting, and sculpture, the big three. And the school that formulated that is in Paris called the School of the Beaux Arts, the Col de Beaux Arts from Louis XIV, originally called the Academy Francaise. And the idea was for Louis XIV in the 1660s was. The French kings were kind of tired of always working with Italian craftsmen from the Renaissance who knew about fashion and style. And so when he became more powerful with winning a lot of wars and his, his coffers became larger and larger, he decided, let's dedicate a national school of French architecture so we could have our own sort of international style that people could revere. So from that became the Academy Francaise where you train French people to become French architects and do the French architecture for Louis XIV, and that evolved in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. So when Wright tours from 1909 to 1911, he sees all the masters that Mayma Cheney thinks he's part of now. He's part of that international claim of Western culture that is, needs, to be, needs to see the underpinnings of what he was actually revolutionary moving away from and see those principles firsthand. So the hollyhock is sort of reversion to that scheme. So if you look at the plan of it, we'll draw it in the right-hand corner by the dates here of the lost years. It is a biaxial plan that looks like something that's palatial, that's got equal wings and breakdowns of a courtyard, which all flare out and have compositions as if you're working from a Renaissance plan type. So the symmetries there are kind of um, forcing right in sort of a European model of doing a highly stylized epic building rather than the nuance he was ending with his prairie career uh, with, with what he was doing back in Taliesin at the time. So we'll come over to um, this edge of our language over here in the home as it wraps around in this T shape, as you come from this bubble, the temple front, it comes off to two identical wings. And then at this point, right about here, the wing is gonna come off, this whole block goes off to the right. It's gonna run all the way through the house towards our left vanishing point, and we'll see the left twin of it. So that foreshortening tells you that the edge of this is probably you know 30 feet away from this edge of the front, living area. And so this will be 30 feet over this way as well. So it'll take us off the paper. So um, the innovation here isn't in the plan type. So it's almost like in the lost years, he's commingling ideas and, and he's trying to invent constantly in terms of the future of architecture and the conditions of architecture. And so he realized that you can have greater flexibility if you move with the times and kind of deal with how construction aspects are, are 
changing in the early modern ages and stuff. So Wright had always worked with systems of architectural design. So whether it's the way he worked with wood, eventually adopts plywood, works with concrete, with concrete block, we can see this promise. And I've got a series of models here that are going to lead us into the language of what he's doing out in California because um, there's always an expense on his sites with material that has to be brought or quarried or mined or, or brought to the site. The, the growing... Uh, prospect of reinforced concrete was you could take local sand and local stone and add Portland cement and water and you create this plastic product, kind of a soupy, sticky product, and then put it in any type of master mold you want and it becomes stone. So the French word for how they invented this, it's uh, I think Hennebeek is his name who invented reinforced concrete for the engineering and architectural world is baton brew, which means strong stone, really powerful. And we've kind of misused the word brew in that as brutal because it's got a brutalistic effect to it. And both sorts of students here, whether it's Madison or Milwaukee, there's a lot of brutalistic buildings on campus because in the 50s and 60s, a lot of people were charmed by the effects of reinforced concrete building architecture cheaper. And so the state really got behind a lot of reinforced concrete construction and made it exposed as an expression of the time. So the brutalistic architecture comes from what Wright was going through and what the French had invented in the 1890s. So within that, Wright tried to figure out a way, not just in pouring a, a concrete wall, which we'll see over here on the right side, and then kind of skim coated so it looks a little decorative, but Wright also tried to work with systems within that from his Liebermeister that also did that with panels of language that we've seen before with Louis Sullivan. Let me tilt that a little bit so you can see this. So these are uh, cast panels where you create the mother shape out of one unit of material. And once that hardens, then you can kind of put over that another system of device that would then go on a liquid form. So you pull that off and it ends up being sort of a master mold. And so in a sense, you turn that over but every time you put in a liquid product like a cast metal and then break off the mold, you could have repetitive tiles made. And so Sullivan did that sort of using the contemporary ideas of the upcoming modern age of changing how we look at materials to reduce the expense of the actual crafts in themselves, dealing with the art and the craft of the machine. And so imagine these tiles from uh, the Chicago Journal Board of Trade in Chicago at kind of a scale larger than my hands, but not much larger than maybe 12 by 12, then having to repeat along the corner side and inside of the space. This is what Wright was introduced to when he met uh, Louis Sullivan in Chicago. So then Wright very quickly took that language and started to adapt that into some of his ideas in these lost years, which is part of the provocative idea of what he does at the Hollyhock as well as other reinforced block homes. Instead of the actual pour itself, they're through, uh, concrete tablet, so to speak. So I just run through these really quick until we get to the final one at, at um, Hollyhock. The first we'll look at here is when he worked on the Biltmore Hotel. This is going to be a concrete product, which is in liquid state, then poured into a mold, and then creates panels of black. And this is just the design skin that you can print offline. So it doesn't have the depth to the piece. But it shows there's void in here, which allows for better, better acoustical privacy between rooms as the sound gets captured in the wall itself, so it bounces off of it. So it had two focus points. Then it also had the idea that it was directional. So Wright could put one of these on top of the reverse beneath it or side by side. So you could change the pattern of what's happening to the geometry inside of that. So Wright was very interested in the idea of working with this new systemized idea of working with a plastic product that's liquid in its, in its infancy. And then over time, over the days as it cures, it becomes just as um, compressive strength as stone does itself. And that's the reinforced concrete. In this case, there wouldn't be much reinforcing in this if there's some web, depends on the depth of it. Obviously in architecture itself, there are ribbons of steel and meshes of steel inside to give the tensile cap capacity as well as the compressive of the concrete. Another California property out here is the Ennis House. 
And so this one is, I believe, a series of 27 different tiles to the Annis house, which all are patterned off of breaking down uh, overlapping squares. But you can see how four of these brought together would create one larger looking tile with a larger square in the center of those four as they rotate around as they go up on the building. And you may know the Ennis House from uh, popular culture, uh, Blade Runner done, I think, in the early, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, oftentimes they use right homes as futuristic ideas. And so the apartment for Harrison Ford there was inside the Ennis residence. And so a lot of times the back shots of some of the scenes in Blade Runner, you'll see these ready motifs on the interior of the home too. Uh, the Freeman House is another one down the road from the Barnsdale at the University of Southern California. I believe the Department of Architecture actually purchased the Freeman House and then fate would have it uh, when the uh, earthquake hit, it really devastated the home. And I think it's under the process of restoration now. But again, he designs these patterns based on kind of the systems you are where your geometries are interrelated and they're kind of growing um, naturally within each other. But again, restrained by the square panel. But if you join them together and have four create, then the four join and create something between the series as they move about on the skin of the building. Let's see a fourth one here. This is another black culture for the Imperial Hotel for a different room. And then the one will take us to our piece here are the blocks you created based on Ellen Barsdale love of the hollyhock plant. So for those who are kind of looking at that, seeing how this relates to a plant is you'll see the stem and the structure coming out of the grade here and then stand up. And then the floral elements come up in sort of very uh, rigid orthogonal pattern. It's obviously more naturalistic. So Wright straps it down to sort of a drafted iconography for it and then systematizes that. So when we come back here and sketch this in, we're responsible for showing those towers of hollyhocks that come up on that um, level of decorative ornament there. So it's modern language being decorated at the same time. And so this is um, uh, part of that idea in the, in the textbook when you brought the film talking about how you work from something natural into a form like this, right off and taught the idea to the students of nature patterning. And that's where you come in and you start with something lifelike, whether it's a beetle or whether it's a flower or whether it's a crystal. And you look at the geometries of it and you simply do a line drawing of it first. And then you let the geometries that are inherently in there kind of explode out and see how they relate to each other. And then you sort of take the object away, the original object and say, what can I use that for in terms of scale of the design? Is that the plan of the city? Is it an earring? Is it a dress for a woman? Is it furniture? Is it a house? So that he can learn from that pattern language to expose the promontory of the site he's working in, in terms of the language of nature. So what we're gonna do now is kind of quickly do the shell of this. And so the reason why uh, we're at this sort of truncated volume here where it doesn't seem like it's quite perpendicular with the lower wall. It's because Wright is also seeking in uh, this decade here, the lost years, to stay away from European culture, even though he's kind of gravitating toward the Beaux-Arts plan here, uh, to integrate ideas that are only American. And so he wouldn't just stick to sort of the states proper, but the idea of North or South American. So he looks in this case to Mayan culture and they have in their temple types, the tops of their views don't have the traditional type of trabiation or Greek architecture because the cultures were simply divided from each other. So in this case, it's got sort of canted 85 degree pitch of a Mayan temple. Let's run over here and edge here. And then it comes down to its stasis or it's more rectilinear form, which then supports that. So um, it was his way of adorning this building with something that was Mesoamerican, that's Middle American from centuries ago. And having that be sort of the, the heightened aspect of coming towards the final living space of the property. 
And when you come down from the blocks on either side, you're received by this horizontal line that runs along that base. Kind of the lintel or the entablature of classical language now adorned with the Mayan epic there. Okay, then the uh, the interior volume is is formal. It's got the presence of some features we'll talk about in a little bit, but the language of it is, is fairly simplistic with block-like language. So we're going to come to the skin here and we're going to show the twin blocks of openings here on either side. And there's a lintel that runs across and then a break of uh, panels of light that will let light into the living space from the setting, setting western sun. So there are an opening and then a structural column and then an opening, another structural column and then a complete opening of a clear space and then the repeat, opening column and the opening. So what we can do right away is kind of assign some values so we see the interiority and then the cast shadows on these. So we're gonna to come to the edge of these and show that the glazing is kind of the darkest. So we'll start with that and that. So the columns have depth to them. And then this whole zone right now, you know, in due west light, it's such a direct thing. I mean, in California, there's probably shades pulled down most of the time, but we're drawing it from that Western aspect. And then again, the side of that and the side of this one. So glazing and the final bit of glazing. And in the corner. So that's the, the projection, the sort of view. And again, much like the earlier prairie homes, there would be this overall horizontal talent of the view because if you're inside looking out, you get the sense of it being long and wide. And so you'll see the breathtaking horizon looking out across LA towards the Pacific. So uh, we'll see these windows are on this side, which is the it moves the secondary rooms away from the main living space. They're twinned over on this side, but they're behind the main volumes. So we're not going to see openings on this wing because it comes out to uh, a massive end at that point. So here we'll put the value down right to the wing wall. Value down there. And now the shade will help us kind of define this too, is we're going to project it from the west, but we're going to make it um, probably later in the, in the summer so that it's laying up the west side, but also the northwest side too, instead of the southwest side, because we want this corner to really jump out. So we're gonna put a whole shade side on the south side of the building for now. And then I'll step down all the way from the top. And then it'll cast a shadow on our wing over here. So we'll leave that a certain gray for now. We'll come back and make that even stronger because you want the shadow to be darker than the shade. Um, I believe there's a couple of ribbon windows over here, but not much because due to the heat in California, most of the time, he really thought of the home as being more of a, a cooling tank. So the masonry itself would have a cooling effect to be inside of this in sort of early air conditioning days where it really wasn't expected much and really didn't take off until the 30s and 40s after uh, between the wars where air conditioning became more prominent in homes. So he was struggling with that to kind of make this massive space kind of contain itself by itself. So we'll see a little slip of light over here, but the masonry walls, the concrete walls will have that effect of cooling. And that'll drop down here. And then we have the end of our block coming down and it sits down on the front garden, which is a garden from 
Elaine Barzales, hollyhocks that grow up. And we'll put those in later as sort of a secondary effect. If you did it literally in, in their intensity, they would kind of cut up the architecture. So we'll pull back on that for now. And then what happens on the site, just like I mentioned on your property too, is you want to have the building always rise up off the terrain. In this case, right, right has the building step up as you come into it, but also when you're outside of the skin of the earth, you actually can step down into secondary ideas. So in this case, right has a terrace tiered stair that takes you down to a watered garden here. And that's his idea of being theatrical because this really is meant to be kind of a performance live theater complex for the arts because she was, um, I believe she was an oil baroness. And she had a lot of extra money to perform with the arts and be a supporter of it. And so just being around the complex, it seemed like it had a theatrical event to it. So every space adjacent to the outside skin has got zones of articulation of potential to it. And so that's where I think it's important to you to think about that within your scheme as well to show the idea that once you're outside the building, this is actually one wall of a new interior on your site as well. So this will drop down to the corner and we'll simply wash off this side. That comes down to the side wall. And I'll cast a shadow on the side wall there. And that little bit will project all the way down is what it casts on a diagonal coming off of that because the sun's coming from the north and west and then stop with its depth of what it's cast on the ground. And that'll help sit the building down now. So now we've got a little bit of a sense of all the weight of this concrete and how it really has to come down and make a 90 degree turn down there to sit the building down on the piece of paper. Because again, as usual, we're trying to get an enormous amount of mass to sit on something that's barely thick at all. Okay, so these act as uh, sort of zones of uh, staggered horizontal lines, which is step back for us, run over here. In this case, I'm not sure if, if this photograph that I'm drawing from is actually accurate to what the original garden was like, but in this case, it stops right here. So again, coming off that left vanishing point, it takes, you know, sort of the, if you look at the biaxial symmetry and find all that box it drops down here come up the left vanishing point that's the middle of that garden that comes shooting out so that's the western aspect as the sun sets in la here okay now the sun's very brilliant so it's going to keep this the tops of these really well lit there's no decoration it's just the purity of the concrete itself just like the mason would be in the meso american tradition there so what he does to sort of ornament this and there'd be sort of geometric patternings that Wright used earlier, like the bulk residence that kind of harken back to Mesoamerica. In this case, it had to be the hollyhock. So our job here now is, is because this is a really intense subject. Look at the detail of that as one little piece. And we have to do this um, 16 or 18 times across here. We have to figure out a system of how to kind of make that a sketch and not make that the art itself. So all we're going to do is sort of work at the idea that what is this like with light and shape? And so we're looking for this sort of dark shadow line that will project it back on the architecture as our, our key feature. So if we simply look at the height and then stepping down on the side and the height stepping down to start with, almost like little soldiers of plant life. And then as it comes down, it breaks at the top of that chain and flares out. So on the other side, we'll show the top of that piece. And to separate them out, we have to come down with this piece coming down into its neighboring piece. So it's like a simplification or a, a way to kind of justify the language of the hollyhock. And then maybe the ones that are closer to us on this end, because this is probably a more dominant part of the sketch than what trails off to the left, we could come back in and show some of the breaking down of the patterns of the floral qualities that build up with the plant here. 
and then just kind of dissipate that off. So very quickly there, rather than trying to draw this 18 times in a row, I sort of got the idea of the scale of this very ornate plant life on the skin of the building. And now it runs across and wraps around the side of it too, which becomes even more complicated because it's in the shade. So we can just sort of start it with some depth here and just use lines dissipating back. Okay, then we have a twin wall that runs from this height all the way across the property on this side and then starts on that same line and carries over. And it is the lengthiest part. So once you're out here in that forecourt, it kind of holds the whole site in the front yard there. And so that gives a nice kind of, again, a Cola Bazaar's base to this. And so we'll need that to be nice and bright. And now to set that all down, it is an esplanade of green glass. So these are a concrete pour stair, but on top of that is the, the depth of the color, rich kind of grass green. In our case, it'll just be a middle gray, and that's gonna wrap around on three sides of our sunken garden here. So this is where we refer to the sketch as just a wash. We're not really doing line. We're just trying to make this as monolithic as possible to, again, sit the building down. That's a good start for that. Uh, and maybe this comes, I think it would probably come right to the top of this stair tread there. And now we've got the problem of the page white itself because we wanna make sure that this is receiving the brilliant California sun here and it's, it's competing with the paper. So fortunately on the site, there's a lot of mature trees as well. So we'll come back on the backdrop and just sort of do an outline of which looks like some sky or rock or junipers here, and then a deciduous tree next to it. And that comes all the way down to a little trollage in the backdrop off the site. But it's a pretty large mass. And so we can simply wash a tone right up to that edge. Into here. And the trillage is actually in shade so that we're not going to see much definition over there, but we'll vary it to make sure we, we're just telling people that we know there's not really a subject, but it's out there as a piece of architecture. And so now that's our placeholder to kind of frame the building because in the distance now, uh, there is part of his detail that comes up and little sculpture things in the back inner courtyard for it as kind of the final shape in the distance here. And then just beyond that are some of these mature trees in the distance. So we'll see a little bit of depth that'll come up and kind of kiss this back corner with a darker value. And so that'll, that'll sort of terminate our sketch in the upper right for us. Okay, now what we'd like to do is, is tease us by saying that we know this is the exterior form and how it's working. We can use this right vanishing point and eventually the left to actually show us activity inside the space. So we're not gonna articulate it much just to get people to think this is actually is glass. Right now in value, it looks like it probably is glass, but to show there actually is a room in there, we'll come from the corner inside the space. If you come inside the interior, it's somewhere up here, and we're gonna project back to this vanishing point. Because that's a horizontal line, which is parallel with these horizontal lines. It just happens to be inside the building but they're all parallel lines in space. So once we get to this point, we start to see that wall back in that space. Now that gives a sense of ceiling and that wall back in there. And then we also see this line coming in from the T shape of the plan coming in, and that's gonna run in and hit a cornered element. So maybe there's a break without setting the interior just yet, which will say there's a break of moving back into that side corridor here. And then obviously knowing right, once you look at some interiors for the website, for the uh, Hollyhock Hall, because it's a big tourist site, obviously, it's one of the bigger ones in, in LA. And so the website can ticket you when you get out there, you'll see all the interiors and how lovely they are. And there will be just like we asked you next week, 
those quintessential views, it'll show the whole package of the 1920 version of Prairie and how it's starting to evolve in Wright's imagination. So there are secondary ideas of planes and space that are moving through this, just like in his other architecture. So we can change the value of some because he's got a lot of painted artwork on the wall skins, furnishing levels. And just, it's not the realistic version of it, but it shows that we're looking through the idea into the interior space there. So I mentioned Wright uh, couldn't be here all the time. That happens a lot with somebody of Wright's stature. He's working with other clients and we're uh, outside the country in, in Pira Hotel. So um, he delegated it to his son, Lloyd Wright, at the time. Lloyd Wright, who we talked before, was the inventor of Lincoln Logs. Um, also had a career as an architect. And also to Rudolf Schindler. And right at the time had two incredible Viennese architects that sought him out, left Vienna and came over here to work for Wright in Oak Park. And they became sort of the, the master draftsman for projects on site. So Schindler was in charge of this. Neutra was in charge of other projects. And Schindler, uh, sort of staying out in California, had a, a wonderful modern career himself. As a matter of fact, this house on Kings Road is spectacular. If you're in L.A., I would go to Schindler's home before I'd come to Hollyhock if you're limited on time. Um, Eventually, Wright was actually fired for the project in the early 20s, like it was coming to an end in 1921 because of cost overages, because obviously it was a new type of technique for Wright. It was an expansive budget, but even that got out of control. So um, eventually, just disillusioned by the cost, Barnsdale donated the house to the city of L.A. in 1927. So really, by the time it opened in 21, it really had a short life in terms of what it was intentional for and then kind of was in and out of ruin estate. The city kind of repaired it in the 50s a little bit. There was the damage that damaged the Freeman House I told you about at USC, also damaged the, um, the Barnesdale home too, but restored and open to the public in June of 05. So it's got the central courtyard. Uh, it's got the Mayan language to it. It's got a cool idea of the moat on the backside you cross through. So there's water involved. There's a lovely place when you come to the actual hearth itself and it's got this great mural above it but the hearth representing the water itself is actually got an open-aired ceiling up above that could let the rain in into a waterway down below that collects the water and moves it out of the house so that sort of earth wind and fire and all the elements of just life itself are part of the artwork inside in this lovely climate you could pull that off of in california and it's the hollyhock itself. It's it's the pattern language of the plant's general appearance. It's stylized for that. Uh, and then Wright actually sort of started to experiment on different aspects of this with more clarity than modern, where it tries to have an actual mitered edge of a window when it comes to a corner out of glass meeting glass, which becomes a real prominent feature in later homes like the falling water. Turns out cantilever concrete doesn't do well in an earthquake environment so there was trouble with that and on the site there are also um, many revisions over time two smaller structures studio residents a and b were built on the grounds residence a still stands it's a lovely kind of modernist piece which is more in the tendency of where right was heading than the actual home proper was here and i believe the other austrian architect richard neutra also has a principal building on the property now too so let's just uh, dive into the last couple of minutes here and do our final detailing with the values we want to get from, you know, page white to the black as we get in the Prismacolor pencils. So I would say return to the edges in our corners and make sure those are a strong line because they're separating space there at those points. And make sure the change of that shade side is darkest at that edge and then fans out to light and then maybe it comes darker again we come to the projection here. That's the back piece that leads towards the courtyard. Continue that stronger edge as you work your way down the side here. Again, it can drop out to almost page white, middle of a plane, and then return to dark a little bit later. This is a cast shadow on the space, so that's a deeper tone than an actual shade side would be coming down to the ground. 
You see the top of the wall, and that'll be the same thing being a deeper tone thrown on here. And then because these are interiors we're looking back into, assuming the blinds are pulled up, even though they're also facing west-ish, you can open those up with their trim and make those a bit darker. And then maybe put even a lower cast of black inside those to show some activity in the distance. I'm gonna do the same thing here because in daylight, the strongest light isn't gonna cast shadow, it's going to be the interior that can't be lit even close to daylight itself. So if this is a mural or a tone that's on a higher wall, it'll go fairly dark in the back of the room. You can take that ceiling and wash out a little bit grayer. So that window is probably the darkest out of the series of them. Just to add some value to those. Uh, we do see the underside of the, of the plinth here because the horizon line is beneath it. So it'll be a nice dark area, the depth of that wall. And then obviously the right side of all these concrete columns are darker and then that edge against the interior. Let's going to freshen that up. Uh, we've got our large mantles here. They cast a little bit of shadow as they work their way around. Up here. A sharper pencil. And we'll work around the side here and have this hold its edge. This wall hold its edge. Because this is, um, it's all receiving Western light, so you'd think hypothetically it's all the same brightness, but this is the brightness that's closer to us. So this has to actually be a lighter gray adjacent to it. So I'll send that volume back a little bit and send that back a little bit. Then it can go back to page white as it dissipates out. But it really can't be the same white, otherwise it stays in the same plane. Then we'll pull out that edge, nice and dark again, down to here. And now we'll come to the landscape and make sure we support all the whites we've got. So to make this even brighter white, we'll come into the base of the trees and we'll shape them a little bit where they're casting shadow onto themselves and push that right against the edge of the hollyhock there, and then dissipate it out because we care less about this part of the sketch than the center part. And if you want, you can do a little more detail on the edge of the tree, but you don't want to detail all the way over here because you're taking our interest away from the subject. So show a little bit of character of the foliage and whether it's deciduous or conifer there. And we can do a little cast shadow. Hollyhocks here. And get that textural quality. And then run some of the darker grass area right up to the edge to sit the building down. Uh, we'll see not just the face, the Go to the stair with the tread a little bit. We can double up that baseline and make it seem like it's stepping down. And we won't see that on this side because we're looking, you know, down on the edge of that tread moving down. And because it's it's poured in place concrete, it doesn't have any type of stone, uh, you know, masonry mortar between things. It's just a, a smooth plane to it. So in a sense, it's got that modernist quality of what the Unity Temple had, which is a little more textural. But again, the plan type is just such a sort of aberration in his career. But that's the effect that coming back from Europe and seeing all the historical masterpieces in Berlin and Paris and Rome and And I think maybe a little bit more at the base here, and that should do it. So there we have the hollyhock from 1921. Uh, I think probably well worth the visit in LA. Put it on your to-do list there. But also explore other pieces. The Freeman's in town. The Ennis is in town. They're all 
got their days when they're open up to the general public. So once you get out there, watch your tourism around Frank Lloyd Wright. That's it for today. I'll stay on for questions. Well, if I get this on record, since I'm still taping, I really appreciate it with all your future submissions to make sure they're 300 DPI, because that's a decent quality to print from, and that they're JPEGs. Because uh, somehow when, the, when I print from the PDFs towards the university printer in the admin area, it does resizing on the PDFs. And rather than having to take all your work into Photoshop, you can just save them as JPEGs. That saves me a lot of trouble. And again, 11 o'clock, that's when I start this. So I got to shut down on feedback and printing of those uh, right at 11. So make sure you get in well before then, next Tuesday. All right, sounds good. Um, I figure I'll go first. Looks like there's a few left in here, but... Um, um, got a question about my site um, yeah i've picked uh, a lot that uh, my dad and i actually bought a number of years back and um it's a it's an island actually in canada um and i thought oh that'd be great we've always been a little unsure of what to build for our uh, for our fourth season um it, the cabin we built on there is just a one season job now but um it's a beautiful little thing but it's you know, it's cold enough up there. Um, yeah. And with that comes, you know, some unique uh, challenges. <laughs> the, uh, you know, this, this at first I thought, oh, this would be a great opportunity to design something small under 800, well, under a thousand square feet. Uh, yeah. Keeps it cabin, you know, uh, for taxes. And um, I think this would be great. So I started drawing and uh, I, I sort of drew that first one I submitted last week. And, um, and now I've, probably spent about three or four hours a night work reworking that thing um and i've gotten to a point where i've changed everything so it kind of squeezes in and i don't like any part of it and so <laughs> so, <laughs> so so i've sort of redesigned it into uh um to a point where i'm starting to introduce more problems than it had before um and i i realized the first drawing i didn't have the interior done right at all because um i think i had based it on some of those larger living rooms that Wright did that were really open yeah um, and you know at 800 square feet the whole thing was open and i thought you know went back and looked at some of the lectures and was just like aha there's a lot more to how he was doing the interiors so i um started applying some of that philosophy to the to the interior read it all that and now i'm just like i sort of feel like just starting over and 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 just starting by building the rooms as sort of modular units and then you know combining them um into a form um afterward and um uh, yeah that's that's kind of the process um i think in the very first video uh for mm -hmm. those who are completely new to architecture that's why architects really start with what's called a bubble diagram where oh, you yeah. simply assign a generic geometry whether it's a circle or a blob or a square it's a it's ideal square footage like an eight by ten bedroom sure because nobody wants to live in a three by 14 bedroom and, an eight <laughs> by 10. and you have x number of those a half bath is four by three by eight a full bath is minimum five by eight whatever some just ergonomic thing then mm -hmm. you kind of put them like a little flow chart how you're going to sit on the site without even our architecture but just a spatial relationship and mm -hmm. then comes down the grid paper and see how you can systematize it as a builder thinks and how Wright would think in terms of how they're growing from each other and where is the kind of the spiritual soul of the property. And, sure. Uh, and if you're capping out a thousand square feet and you're in a place with, you know, incredible climate conditions, 
Mm -hmm. uh, you certainly do a 12 to 14 inch wall and, and kind of get it down to zero net if you can. Sure. Just super insulate it and then mm -hmm. throw some, um, I don't know if the site's got big enough for wind turbines or solar panels, but you could sure. probably, you know, cut down your energy use down to probably 10 or 15% up there if you sort of just do passive design techniques. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that'd be good. We, um, we've actually got a single solar cell driving the entire uh, existing cabin, which is small enough, but, um, you know, just in the uh, summer and fall months before the freeze yeah. sets in. But, um, yeah, with, you know, that other one's actually kind of um, not getting a lot in, in solar gain. So um, this one might actually be in a better position to make use of that. But um, yeah, right. I think our, our challenge for the winter is that, you know, you got to chop wood all all, all summer and fall in order to uh, have enough to make it through winter. Yeah. And, um, you know, and with that, there's, it's about an hour boat ride from the nearest landing uh, yeah. to the Island. And so I thought, well, I could, I know everyone else has to design a garage and obviously there's no need for a garage on this little yeah. Island, but maybe I could, you know, not that it could actually legally build it, but put a boathouse on the plan. <laughs> just to what, uh, what lake is it on? It's called the uh, Seine uh, River. It's not really a river. It's a giant flowage. Um, it's just in Ontario, pretty much straight north by about 14 hours. And um, it's uh, not too far from Atacokan. And, so um, uh, you, you fly in and then you boat in from there? We actually just drive up because um, there's only three, I think, other properties on the, on the body of water. It's a huge, I think it's 22,000 miles of shoreline or something. It's a big craggy thing. But one of the other properties does seaplane in, and um, he's a dentist from somewhere, I forget. But uh, uh, that approach, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it works until you have a problem with your plane. Um, there yeah. is absolutely nothing anywhere around. So, <laughs> so we go for maximum reliability. So we put it in a canoe and, and, uh, and actually paddle in instead. Cause, yeah. You know, but that was uh, exotic. Well, you know, with climate change, you'll be uh, surrounded by people pretty soon. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. I heard yeah. that uh, people should be investing in Duluth because it'll be the major metropolitan area on the sure. Great Lakes. Yeah, yeah. That's, I was just living up there not too long ago. It was a. Uh, there's some talk around town about that, you know. But um, yeah. Well, so for this, um, you know, one of the the challenges I had with this uh, building that I drew last week was the more time I spent on it, the more I started looking like a shotgun check. I was like, you know, yeah. you know, I wanted to sort of pursue the Usonian um, look on some of these more angular, um, even some of these sort of L-shaped uh, projects of rights. And then just realized, yeah, I'm just losing so much heat through all that extra wall and that open space. Yeah. yeah. So I hate to lump all those, you know boxes together into a pile but um i'm sort of um compelled to do that only because of the efficiency but um if well, I, I, think I, know, I, I, I know the the people the knee-jerk reaction for the class if you looked at the last files and stuff this is what mm -hmm. happened is that people <laughs> went right to the jacobs one house and i think mm -hmm. because they thought oh that'll be easiest mm -hmm. and so we got a, we got a ton of this sure <laughs> And there's the carport. And so we mm. see a lot of that of our out of our 55 homes here is this L-shaped plan. Yeah. You know, Wright's got a really lovely part of his career where he just, you know, modulated the box. Mm -hmm. And it, it could be a really efficient volume because outside of you know the way a cat sleeps, that's the most efficient shape out there in terms of energy. Sure. Yep. So just you know, get yourself organized and go back. And there's nothing wrong with being a, a 1902 write-in. Oh, you don't sure. have to be 19, uh, 1934. We're still almost 100 years away from both of them. Mm, so yeah. they're really elegant. They're really beautiful things. And they're, they could be really climate efficient, too. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Yeah, well, I saw some small place out in Madison out in the hills, I think it's in a park now that was just recently restored, maybe in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and I, th I don't remember the name of it, but it was a small little cabin. I'm going to try to find it again, but um, I just saw it in the last year, uh, some pictures of it. Uh, it was redone and um, it's just a beautiful little thing. It looked like it's one of those sort of later Usonian things that was 
very chunky and and um yeah. sort of puzzle yeah. to look at, you know. Well, and, and I mentioned uh, the ASB building is the American system built. If you look yeah. those up, the ones that got built in Milwaukee here on Burnham, uh look at the cottage. That's the one that our department helped rehab oh, uh, wow. back in the day. And it really is a square and plan, but it 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 doesn't have that kind of drab look because right just articulated enough so it seemed like it was a charming small home for sure. our worker class people. Huh. And the duplexes next to them are really stunningly beautiful, but they're really modest buildings too. They're just basically long rectangles that are adorned well. Okay. Hmm. Um, and I'd, I'd like to push the class in different directions so we don't I don't have to look at 37 Usonian. <laughs> Jacob's sure. one. Home, so. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. yeah, sure. Okay. All right. Well, sounds good. Well, yeah, uh, do some more work on that. So, okay. Uh, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Bye-bye.